G'day, this is Paul Coleman, drinking Norwegian coffee. <laughs> In Norway. Yeah, we are the body. <laughs> why are these arms? Why are these words teaching? Why love's all the words teaching? Yeah, we are the body. So there's That's that. Awesome. There's that, right? And then there's, um, would you like to hear some news? I voice? would like to hear Bob Dylan do the news voice. Okay, yeah. like pick a song. Uh, Shine. Okay. <clears throat> shine. Make them wonder what you got. Make them wish that they were not. On the outside looking bad. Everybody's gonna shine. <laughs> Let them shine before all men. Let them see good works and then. Let them glorify the Lord. Everybody shine. I love that. Okay, now that's all right. great, okay, but here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> what if we take right. the greatness that is your Bob Dylan impression and right. marry that to the greatness that is Striper? Okay. I don't know if you've ever done that before, no. so I printed out uh, some lyrics to Soldiers Under Command. Okay, bring it. Which is the best Striper right song here. ever. Here, let me give you that. All right, okay, great. All right, you got that. And so you're just going to do this off the cuff. Okay, that's the chorus. You can do whatever you want. All right, here we go. So do you think a minor key? Probably more a minor key, right? Maybe, although it is victorious. We are soldiers under God's command. <laughs> we hold a two-edged sword, yeah, with our hands. We're not ashamed to stand up for what is right. We will win without sin. If it is not right by my mind. For the better plan. Very nice. I that? like that. Yeah. I, I closed my eyes and tried to picture you in spandex <laughs> doing that, and I quickly got that out of my head. Love me like you say you do. One thing I like about Chris is his smile. It's a legend. It's a legend. Oh, the one thing I like about Chris is his spiky hair. <laughs> about you, Phil Joel, is you look like your wife from behind. <laughs> no, she's blonde and thin and gorgeous. <laughs> See? The one thing I don't trust that is you, you love me like you say. Hey everybody, how you doing? Just appreciate you guys coming out on the go tour. We had such a blast, and in fact, we had such a good time. We're going to extend it. So, uh, what? Yes, I didn't tell you. You didn't get the memo. With, with what? It's summer's idea. Summer. She, yeah, she loved the tour so much. We're coming out, and we're uh, we're going to add more shows in the fall. So hopefully, we come and see you. Till then, we'll be at the summer festivals. Uh, we're going to be at Creation, Kingdom Bound. Where else are you going? Atlanta Fest. It's summer's tour, actually. Yeah. We're just the opening act. <laughs> it's the summer festival. Yeah, so we're going to be at all the summer. Well, not all of them, maybe. But and the fall. Awesome. Yes. Go so tour extended. Extended.
Who enjoyed seeing Paul Coleman live at main stage last night? Woo! Paul, let me start with you firstly. What was it like being back in Australia on the main stage singing uh, I Come From The Land Down Under and the kookaburra sits in the gum tree about time? How's it feel? The best be part was that I often sing that song around the world, but this is, it's so nice when people actually know the rest of the chorus. <laughs> because normally we get to that second line and they have... <laughs> I don't know, I just... For me, anyway, um, the audience has always been, you know, the bigger, bigger part of the show than me because there's more of them. Mm. So I, I kind of enjoy, I kind of enjoy the feralness of an Australian crowd. <laughs> You never, they can turn on you in a heartbeat. And I find that exciting and exhilarating. And sometimes when you play in other countries, people are very quiet and I don't really know what to do with myself. Yeah. But I don't, I even get heckled in church in Australia. <laughs> it's the way it should be, eh? <laughs> Amen, Peter said. <laughs> no, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed myself. And then playing here afterwards as well. Really great. And how did you feel about Lenny? You know, <laughs> there's a scripture. <laughs> Bind the strong man, you take the whole house. <laughs> so if you find that one guy in the audience that you can have a bit of fun with, normally it uh, helps focus. But then again, what I, I, what I liked about him and, and other people like Lenny is that they're not particularly impressed by who you are. They're like, yeah, whatever. And I kind of like that mm. because it, you, need, you need lots of reminders not to take yourself seriously because in the end, you're just like everybody else. You just happen to have a gift that... Um, puts you on a stage, but really, you're just a normal person. So for someone to go, yeah, whatever, I kind of like that <laughs> for a little while. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Do you want to fight me, mate? No. <laughs> I can tell you a story about Peter and that if you want. Want to hear the story? Okay, so a few years ago when we played here as the Newsboys, uh, everyone else went to Brisbane to hang out, and I went to, s I went to stay with Peter and his parents up at the Sunshine Coast. And uh, I wanted to see where he came from, and he took me uh, body surfing. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, let's catch a waves, mate, there's some good waves out there. And so we, we caught a few, and he was, a, he was a lifesaver when he was a kid, so he was a bit better at it than I was. But he said, okay, mate, I got the munchies, let's, uh, let's catch one more wave into the beach. I said, all right, and he goes, now we have to agree on it. I said, all right. So we go, with this one, this one, no, no, okay. This one, nah, this one, this is it, all right. We both go, and I went into it, and it just dumped me. Like, I had sand in my mouth, I had, and then I look over to see, and he wasn't there. He, was, he hadn't even caught the wave. And then he caught a nice one in, and I go, what happened to him, mate? He goes, I wasn't gonna catch that, it was a dumper. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I don't wanna fight you, Pete. I won my last fight by 30 meters. <laughs> Anyway, that was a long answer, wasn't it? Sorry about that. Well, it's so good to have you guys here. And Peter Furler uh, on main stage tonight. <laughs> Woo! I think for us, it's been... Um, for Paul and I and for Phil, Joel, and for uh, several of the guys, it's been just to have joy and the peace of just, you know, friendship. You know, it's more, it's greater than music. And uh, the music is what's bringing us together. And so... Uh, it's been awesome just to come and just to be with Paul and to be with Phil and to and to laugh, you know, like friends. And uh, so on stage tonight, you'll probably see a lot of laughter and uh, a lot of forgotten lyrics and a lot of uh, th what chord are you playing? Because I'm not playing that one, you know. It's just going to be really cool for for all of us. So for me, it's just going to be a surreal time of looking around and seeing my friends and and uh, guys that I love and just jamming, you know, and playing music and. Uh, so they've only given us an hour, so we'll try to keep it down to about two hours, you know, yeah. And are you going to let Paul sing, or are you do, is he just playing Paul guitar? can sing any time he wants. Yeah? In fact, he just usually sings any time he wants. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, Peter, the, the Newsboys, of course, years ago, let's, let's go back a little bit. You know, I remember Hell is for Wimps actually had the shirt. Sorry about that. <laughs> And uh, the revolving drum kit. You, you used to be the drummer, got, yeah, back in the day, yeah. Uh, and uh, I still have the rashes. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, John James, your good John mate, James, was, good mate, was yeah. the lead singer. That's right. Tell us about what was the transition from John to you, and what you know, how, how did that all happen? What, what worked then? You know. You sure you want to go there? <laughs> no. uh, we would drive from the Sunshine Coast, Johnny James and I, and uh, 
and George actually too. And uh, so the three of us would drive up here in an older, like a, in a Cono van, you know what I mean? And we'd have all the, the back would be stacked. We would have 180 dozen lamingtons and uh, we would have to just go from door to door and to shops and to knock on the door and, uh, and uh, just to try to sell these lamingtons. What and was so your sales pitch like? Do you remember it? No, it wasn't very good. A lot of times I figured out that it was usually one in ten might have bought. So there's a lot of rejection. Right. You know, and you know Aussies, it's kind of like you're not going to, excuse me, no. Right. Well, excuse me, no. Right. Get out. So uh, a few things thrown at you every now and then. But, but I kind of, so how can you not be thankful? Not that there's anything wrong with selling lamingtons, but I think even today, just the love of music and, and, and I don't have to sell lamingtons. I'm really thankful to be here. <laughs> Uh, wasn't the first um, time you became the singer, wasn't it in Germany or something? Yeah, that's right. Well, when John, uh, you know, finished up with the band, it was uh, obviously for us, that we were at kind of at the height, you know, and uh, to go from that. I'd always sung in the background, you know, a little bit. I'd done some, I'd done about 50% of the vocals on, lead vocals on the record. So it wasn't so much of a shock there, but the real shock, you know, you've got guys like Paul, he can go out on stage and with an acoustic guitar and entertain people and be funny and do it. Well, I, I don't think I have that in me. To me, it was more of, I was scared to death. You know, I can remember the first show. Well, actually, I don't remember that well. My wife came along and it was in Germany, the first show that I fronted the Newsboys after John. And uh, she said, did you enjoy the show? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. She says, well, I know how you don't know. You didn't open your eyes the whole night. <laughs> and so, and I think it took me about three years to actually look at the crowd. And uh, so it wasn't something that came natural to me as a drummer. You know, I was somebody that liked to be on the drums. I still like to be on the drums. And I'd set the cymbals up if it was a tough crowd. I could set them up and hide. And I was the first one that could run out the back of the hall if it got vicious, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, so it was, uh, yeah, I don't know, it was different. And uh, I think it took me a long time. But that's for all of us. You know, we've all got things, little hurdles we have to get over. And, and uh, they're still there. There's still things that I are trying to better myself uh, at doing public speaking, that's for sure. Jeez. <laughs> now, yesterday I heard you guys in a songwriting uh, workshop in the Bible Society forum there, and uh, Paul made an interesting comment about worship music. Oh. <laughs> I, w I wanted to, I'm curious. I, I'm, I, you know, obviously the news the Newsboys w was one of the <laughs> the Newsboys was one of the the bands that really brought worship music, you know, back onto Christian radio. Uh, you know, you think of Blessed Be Your Name, you think of all these great worship stuff, that, songs that you guys did. Obviously, bands like Third Day, you know, all these, uh, you know, Christian bands started, you know, Delirious, did all these worship songs. There was a real flavour for a season where every Christian band was doing worship songs. Now, Paul, you made a comment yesterday that you thought, Christian artists, Christian songwriters, please stop writing worship songs, we, we have enough. I don't uh, think I said those exact words. Oh, no, you weren't. <laughs> That's what you said, totally. That's what it's... <laughs> And then I told the crowd that I've got a new worship record coming out next week. <laughs> so, Paul, tell us what your thoughts are. Should songwriters be a little more creative than just the straight, you know, write a psalm and it'll be a worship song, you know? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Let me preface this by saying um, this is just my thought. It's not from God, uh, necessarily. It's just a feeling a thought and that is firstly I just dislike the way the word worship is used in that context because when I um I just had a meat pie and it was good <laughs> is that a scripture no. yeah it's, it's sounded like one part of the Bible. and my and palate my palate was aroused and God made that and he made the tastes and he made the beef, because we're in Australia. Uh, not sure where it's genetically engineered in other parts of the world. But my, my senses worshipped God. I didn't have to say it. In the same way as um, when I drive through the countryside in Australia, my eyes are uh, aroused by the wonder of God's creation. I'm a being and, and worshipping God is my life. So to just say a style of music is worship to me is actually f offensive. I find it unbiblical and completely offensive. So therefore if, if I'm writing a song and it's about a broken relationship and I write that as a believer in Jesus and that's what I feel like I'm supposed to do, why is that not a worship song in the same way as God, you're amazing? I just don't see that. 
Having said that, I know in the scriptures there are times when they fell on their knees and worshipped God. I've got no problem with that. But I just, I just think that God has given us so much talent and there's such a limited vocabulary with I raise my hands, I lift my hands, I give you your grace, face. I'm done. I'm just sick of it. I'm done. It's like there's too much of it. It's too much. It's like just having lasagna for five weeks in a row. I'm like, I want an apple. I want something else. And so I think that I'd, I'd just like Christian songwriters to write about other things and about relationships and about the valley, not just about the mountaintop, because I think that other bands are beating us to it and they're writing songs. And you've just got to trust that the Holy Spirit will close the deal. Not everything has to say Jesus and God all the time. So that's just my feeling and my thought. And so rather than make a DVD about it or something, I just decided to make a record like that. And that's what I've done. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying I think there's too much. It feels like everyone feels they have to. Um, and, you know, when you're selling lamingtons, you don't have to go, and Papa, God bless you, God bless you. Here's Jesus, Jesus, God, and there's lamington. You can just go, here's a lamington. I think that was a really, really bad analogy. <laughs> um, quite unnecessary. Can I have a lamington, please? Would you like to buy a lamington? I've got a dozen lamingtons. Hi, my name's Peter. Would you like a lamington? No, rack off. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pete, uh, I've got to say, too, I've loved a lot of the songs you've written over the years, and you've had a, uh, a co-writing partner in Steve Taylor, brilliant songwriter. Um, has he helped you in your latest stuff? Or you, you're doing a lot of it yourself? How, how, would, how did you collaborate on your latest album that's come out? Um, yeah, I've written a lot with Steve Taylor through the years, a great friend, continuing that relationship. And, uh, you know, I, it's great. When I, I'm somebody who likes to, you know, collaborate with other guys because I just enjoy the fellowship. And, uh, and I think it makes it better. I've, I've written songs with Paul that the song is better because Paul was in the room and Phil Joel the same and, and with Steve Taylor. So... Uh, it's something that I kind of enjoy. It's nearly a social thing for me, more so than just, uh, uh, you know, when two people kind of agree on something, it, there's more power to it than just sitting down and writing it yourself. You get kind of more confirmation. And, and also someone like Steve Taylor, it's, it's you know, he's, it's like if you wanted to win the car race and you've got a mini minor and you just there's a guy with a Ferrari, you just got to take the Ferrari and he's that guy. So there's certain songs I know uh, that he's going to... Um, take this to where it needs to, to go. So uh, it's, a, it's a blessing. It's great to, they're relationships that you don't take lightly. Because I know there's so many songwriters that struggle to find and sometimes stop writing songs uh, and give up because there might have been a relationship there that discouraged what they were doing or uh, it wasn't a healthy relationship. And so uh, I'm very thankful to have great friends that have helped me write songs through the years. Now, I think you guys have two of the best voices in Christian music, two brilliant songwriters, great sound. Earlier on today, we had the guys from Evermore on the stage here. Now, they're Christian boys, quite well known in the secular music scene, uh, and they just write good lyrics. They just shine a light, you know. Do you guys ever have, a, a, you know, do you have any plan, do you have any desires to crack it in the mainstream music scene rather than just the Christian music scene? Um, for me personally as a songwriter, um I don't really see it broken down into genres, whether it, if you can call it, like Paul said, worship, or you can call it Christian or secular. I just see any time there's truth there, it's God's truth. Uh, and, and so for me as a, as a songwriter, I, I'm signed to a Christian record label, so they promote my record to Christian radio and through Christian retail, but I don't sit down and think, I need to write a Christian song. Uh, I just try to write the best song that's in my head and try to finish it. That's really it. And so, uh, and I just see, uh, so I hear songs on the radio quite a lot that, you know, I think that's true. And that, there's, there's a truth to that. And, and that's a band that's not a Christian band. And, uh, and then I hear songs sometimes by a Christian band on a Christian radio. I go, I don't believe that. And so it's really, it doesn't mean just because we, we fall. I think, you know, God gives us all gifts and we've all got a creative thing inside all of us, whether it's making a meal or, or decorating a house or coming up with a business plan. We all have a gift. There's a gift there. And what you do is sometimes people pour out uh, words that um, maybe it's in their personal life. You can run into somebody who's 
you know, we call them, what they call them, the energy vampires, you know, then people that you run into that just suck the life out of you, and then you run into somebody else who, when you meet them, you, you walk away feeling encouraged, and I think that's the two types of music. It's not, the Bible talks about, it doesn't say that there's Christian music or secular music, it says the power of life and death's in the tongue, and so that's really how I see it. So the mellow, we, play, we all play the similar chords. We all play the same types of Fender Strats and Les Paul guitars and Marshall amplifiers, and so there's no nothing there. But it's it's the words that come through that make the difference, and that's the word uh, is, can, is what changes a life. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any plans or desire to be out of oh, the mainstream? I have a fantasy to be a talk show host. Yeah, you can totally do that. Yeah, I want to have my own TV show where I just go everywhere in the world and um, just ask people questions about why they believe what they believe. You do that now anyway, so you might as well get a TV show and... Get paid know. for it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I think that's what I would like to do. I don't even think about music much. I only, I only keep making music so I can keep talking. <laughs> I do like it, but I don't think about it a whole lot. But I do, I do like the idea of getting in the middle of uh, culture. I, at the seven-week tour I just did of Australia, I spent so much time in Aussie pubs and restaurants and just talking to Aussies and, and connecting with them. And uh, so the album that I made is really made for people kind of outside the walls of the church and those inside who want something else than the 7-Eleven songs. Same seven words 11 times. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, so I, for me, that's, that's my fantasy to be in that culture. I know You're that dogging my music again, man. <laughs> <laughs> No, the thing is with that, my, my point about the what would people call the worship thing is that if it, if it naturally comes out of you, I think it's really cool. I'm just saying that I think a lot of people think they have to do it because yeah. that's what's out there. Yeah. If that's, what, that's naturally how you write and it's legitimate, awesome. Good. But it just doesn't have, you just don't have to do that. There yeah. are other things. Yeah. That's all I was trying to say. I wasn't trying to knock anyone that does that because I like listening to that stuff myself too. So if there was a, a TV bit. show called Coleman, would you guys watch it? Yeah. yeah? I was thinking about it, call it being called, um, like, uh, what do you think, or questions, or conversations with, I don't know, I would just like, to, I mean, seriously, I was in a pub in Cronulla, mm -hmm. and I can't say everything this guy said in this particular place, but he, he just leant on the bar, and he goes, how the, how are ya? And I said, I'm awesome, mate, how are you? And he goes, oh, I'm awesome. And I go, great, and he goes, why are you so happy? I go, oh, I was just in church, and he goes, what? <laughs> I go, yeah, mate, I was just in church, and he goes, you kidding me? I go, nah, mate. And he goes, oh, that's a bit weird. And I said, yeah, I like Jesus, but I hate religion. And he goes, you're my man, you're my kind of man. And then I gave him a CD, and he was like a little, like a little child getting their first Easter egg. And I think there's so many people out there that are, are, are sort of, um, exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. So you're heckled by infants in this country. <laughs> well, if you ever want to do a TV show, I'll, I'll work with. I'll help you. We I just call, need someone to finance it. That's all. How we you could going? call it History Makers. That's a good name. You wrote a song, or you sang a song called History Makers. <laughs> I wrote it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a delirious song. Anyway, um, Paul, I heard a great story the other day that you told years ago. You know how people do the actions to your songs? Yes. You got a guy up on the stage. Oh. And he kept his hands in his pockets <laughs> and didn't want to do the actions. Can you I tell did me? not. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell that story? It's gold. <laughs> okay, this was in Peoria, Illinois. And uh, <laughs> I just want you to know this is emotional for me. This is the last time I ever beat up anyone for not doing the actions to my song. This was the, the, the Raggedy Ann and Andy Festival. And before you scoff, under Barbie, it's the top of the doll circuit. And uh, the Paul Coleman trio were playing on a flatbed truck at the end of town. And um, there was nothing else going on. So everyone was sitting there in these bleachers and in these sort of chairs people take to the soccer. And they fold up and they've got a drink holder. And they're all sitting there and we were playing Run, the motions uh, that we came up with, a sort of Spice Girl induced. This kind of thing, if you haven't seen them. There's a guy down the front with his hands in his pockets, both hands in his pockets. He's not doing them, and I thought, right, he's my man. So, so I stopped, hey, mate, come on, do the motions, come on. Come on. He, does, he just keeps his hands in his pockets. 
And I'm like, I'm picking on him. Mate, what's your name? Andy. Oh, half the festival's named after you. Andy, Andy. So he's shaking his head. I'm like, is that your wife next to you? And I just, the voices in my head are going, stop, stop. But I'm like, no, no, it's got to be the devil. <laughs> God, God wants me to keep going. So he's got his hands in his pockets like this, right? And I just, I'm like, come on, mate, stand up and do them. So eventually the poor guy got him to stand up and he stands up to do them and he's got, uh, he's just got a stump on this side. There's no hand. Yeah. Oh, no, this isn't, that's, it, it gets worse. And so he's up there doing this. Light a candle in the, and, and everyone's just like, you know, and, and then after he did it, I said these words. Come on, everybody, give him a hand. <laughs> oh. I didn't mean it. And Phil, Phil, our drummer, he had this microphone and he just goes, oh. <laughs> and that, that night I'm lying in bed, I hear, give him a hand, hand, hand. <laughs> give him a hand, hand, hand. Give him a hand, 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 hand. It's just terrible. I picked on a blind kid up here once, um, didn't mean to. There was another kid in the front row and uh, I said, what's your problem? And his friends go, he's deaf. Yeah, so um, I stopped doing that because I don't like really, uh, yeah. So I, there was a guy in the shopping center I just played in who wasn't doing it and I didn't pick on him. That healed me, that experience. <laughs> okay, guys, we've only got a couple of minutes to go. I want to ask Pete the final question. Uh, Pete, we're here. Uh, across the Easter weekend and uh, the heart of Easter festival is the message of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There might be people listening and watching online, listening to Vision Radio, uh, they might hear this at another stage on YouTube. Uh, would you share with everyone here uh, what is the, the message of the gospel? It's the power that's, uh, you know, we need to be delivered by something powerful. I believe that in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, he had a plan. And it's one that we can barely imagine today, but there are signs. We can sense it when we're here just laughing together, that there's something greater that can happen when people get together. And, uh, and you know, there's, so we see it in the artwork throughout history. We can hear it sometimes when a group of people get together and just sing uh, glory to God. We, we get to a, a sense of something greater in ourselves. We know it when, when a well-deserved victory has been won. You know, we get that sense of, yes, justice has been served. These things are signs. And it's that in the beginning when God had that plan, he created this place so beautiful. But part of the plan was to give man a choice. And man, uh, like he does today, chose to be his own God, chose to go his own way. But when that happens, even in our own lives today, doors, so to speak, are open that were never meant to be open. And in through them doors come powerful things. They wreak havoc on this place. Sickness, disease, hurt, pain, gossip, malice, slander. These things are so vicious. They, God hates it. He hates what it does to his people, his creation. And uh, the only way they can be dealt with, because they are so powerful, is by something more powerful than they. Because they're too powerful for science. Science hasn't been able to fix a man's heart. And they're too powerful for medicine. Too powerful for drugs and alcohol. Too powerful for politics too powerful for religion, too powerful for Buddha, for Muhammad, for Confucius, for the New Age. They're too powerful. The only way these things can be dealt with is by something more powerful than they. The only thing more powerful than they is something that has defeated death. And the only thing that's defeated death is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's God's plan. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to uh, seeing Peter on main stage tonight with Paul. And Phil Joel. And, Thanks, guys. Have God fun. Bless. Let's give it up for these guys. Thank you. So how long from when... The, so the record that Newsboys put out just before you left... Yep. Um, I didn't have much to do with that. What was it called again? In the Hands of God. In the Hands of God, yep. that's right. Um, some fantastic songs, but it kind of came sort of at the end. It didn't really seem to get much of an album life that. Yeah, it's a hard... You know, when you, when you get rid of your lead singer, it's not good for the record. Yeah. But there's a song on Apparently. there called um, the RSL song. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Tell us about that, because that's, that's an incredible song. It's got some very emotional bits. And where did that happen, that song? Well, that was really, you know... At that point, I kind of knew this was my last record with the boys. And, uh, you know, it, a lot of your uh, emotions come of just your history of, of uh, you know, the band forming playing 
you know, shows around Australia. Uh, you know, I can remember so many memories of, you know, playing the RSL, you know, playing, uh, you know, the youth group, uh, playing friends' birthday parties and uh, going to the beach and plugging into the toilets and playing, you know, just and trying to uh, use the power, the power, the power. No, I don't mean, yeah. I was going to say, is that a Marshall? Even though there's not a bad reverb in the bowl, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, all the memories that were coming up. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it's like I was just talking to Isaac back there, who I love that guy, you know, and what he's done with this festival and his heart for the city. He's such a brilliant guy. And just, to, you know, to him, you know, I, I guess he's kind of, uh, you know, making decisions now to move into politics and, and, and to kind of hand his his child over, something, this that thing that he planted. And so for me, there was emotions of knowing that uh, I didn't know what was coming into the future, not worried about it, but also at the same time, uh, you know, uh, that was the last song I was singing and I wanted it to be about Australia. I wanted it to be about the early beginnings because I, you never forget that. You, you, uh, you just don't forget it and so have not and never There's a will. sense of the future in the song though too. It's like so roll out. It's right, like, it's, yeah. it's almost like, Keep going, fellas. Yeah, that's right. Well, you hand it off. It's like, you know, Newsboys to me was, I don't know how the analogy would, but it would be close to being like a church. Not that the group was like a church, more like it was like, you know, when a pastor hands over a church, if he's got the right spirit, he wants it to do better and wants it to do well. And you should rejoice in that. And you should want that thing that you had something to do with do well, not for it to fail. And so for me, it was an encouragement to them guys to, hey, here's the baton, go, you know, go for it. And, uh, it's, it's your era now, it's your, it's your band, it's yours, you know. So what did you do um, directly after that? You took time out. Um, I know you moved. Yeah. So where did, you, where did you move from to? Well, right before I moved, I want to put this in because this is the, it's interesting. It, there's probably a few folks here that... Uh, I wrote a lot of the Newsboys material with a guy named Steve Taylor. And any of you folks from, uh, that were around in the 80s scene... Oh, yeah, I see some hair. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well... G'day, mate. I saw, uh, you know, <laughs> Steve was somebody who, uh, you know, was kind of like a, uh, kind of a, a big brother to me, and he still is today. And uh, so he came around my house uh, uh, probably right when I was uh, just handed the stuff off to the boys, and, uh, and he came to me and just sort of approached me about, uh, you know, what are you doing with your life, kind of one of them talks. And I, and I just said, I don't know, but I like it, you know. And... Uh, <laughs> And so we, he said, you got any songs, any music? And you know what it's like when, you've, when you've, you guys have just finished a record. When you finish a record, there's always stuff left over or there's always just this kind of collection of tunes still there. And uh, so I had these bunch of songs. And uh, so Steve came to me and, and said, well, what are you going to do with them? And what do you want to do? And I didn't really know what to do. I, I just said, well, let's finish them because we, you know, we write songs together. Let's do that. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, we'll record them, but long as you sing them. And so Steve being somebody who I, I've just, you know, kind of been a fan of him as a person and creatively, uh, we went in and uh, began to uh, make a record with a, a guy named Jimmy Abeg and John Painter. And so the four of us were just in a room and I was just the drummer. I was back to kind of early newsboys days. I was just this kind of like a kid, four piece drum kit. Uh, there's a guitarist there with one guitar and an amp and there's a bass player and then there's a singer sitting across from me. So for me it was a thrill just to just be creating music. No, no, no record deal, no management, no anything. You know, not, not knowing what's going to happen with it, just the thrill of making music again and rocking out with guys in a room in a, in a garage. You know what I mean? So it was back to Malula Bar, you know. And uh, so uh, we made a record and, and in that process was what got my creative juice is going to just begin to want to sing again and you know and, and feel the thrill of that but yes we did move as well my wife and I we moved down to Florida um, you know again not knowing what the future holds we don't know we might end up at Malula Bar again I don't know you know we don't know what it goes we moved back to down to Florida because actually it it really uh, the area that we moved to feels very sunshine coast to me it's just something about it that just it's got uh, similar type folks similar type uh, pace and uh, so we really it was really kind of that thing again you know you hit a certain point in your life where you really have a yearning to be home and so that felt more like home to me more like the Sunshine Coast than than, than Nashville and so um, tonight you're gonna be singing a couple of new songs yes are they from that session with Steve Taylor uh, no Okay, so you have a new record comes out June twenty yeah. first. That's right. You good? You good? I retained that. Yeah. that's amazing to yeah, me. That's good. Yeah, um, 
I mean, you uh, forgot my name 15 minutes ago, so... <laughs> Steve, I've never... I mean... Uh, <laughs> no, Peter emailed me um, a copy of the record. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Uh, put it on YouTube, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. I'm just kidding. That's all right. Uh, I know, I've got, my, I've got my boys on you. Right. <laughs> okay. It's actually really great. And so that comes out June 21st, and the two songs you're singing from that. So how did that record happen compared to the stuff that you're working on with those guys? What was that process? That process was brilliant. Uh, there's a group playing here you guys should check out uh, called Me In Motion. And so, uh, yeah, good, good guys. And I, and I co-produced the record with Seth, who's the lead singer. And uh, just, it was such a thrill. I really, it, was, it was just the most uh, pleasant and enjoyable record. Not that the others weren't. This was really just a thrill to just be making music again. You know, that, that new, that thing that you feel just to, when you haven't done something in a while and, and where before that you had to do it a lot and you, and you, yeah, you had to do it. Where I didn't have to do it this time. It was just the, for the thrill of making music. So uh, I'm really happy. I wouldn't, you know, I'm an Aussie. I wouldn't be putting it out if I, if I uh, was embarrassed of it or I thought it wasn't up to what I've done in the past. Uh, so I'm really happy with it. I actually had to get, I had a couple of years of the process of making it. So I think it made it a better record as opposed to always being rushed to have to have a certain amount of songs and be ready and, and to meet a certain schedule. So uh, yeah, it comes out June 21th and I'm, I'm really happy with it. So what are the two songs you're singing tonight from that? Tonight I'm singing a song called Reach off the record and that's a single, yep. Thanks mum. Appreciate and that's doing, that. uh, <laughs> that's doing pretty well in America, it's my, uh, my America. understanding is. Yep, it's doing great, yep. Uh, so yeah, there's I, still lots of Peter Furler love out there. You know, I, I really, it's been good. I felt, I felt such a welcome back from people. It's been, uh, that's been the thrill, you know, just to kind of meet people that have listened to your music over the years and... Uh, and, and going and seeing radio stations and such and feeling, I wasn't sure, you know, you don't know, you know, people, you're not sure what to expect, but it's been good, so. So that's Reach, and then what's the other one? The other one's called All In Your Head. It's about you. All yeah. In Your Head. <laughs> <laughs> what's that all about? All uh, In Your I Head. Tell, I can't tell, it's too deep, mate. Too it's deep. too deep? Yeah. One of the, um, one of the things about Peter is um, on stage, he's kind of crazy. Have you noticed? He's just out there. But, uh, but off stage, he's, he's a very gentle guy. He's got a very gentle demeanor. He's very softly spoken. I like pets. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's not gonna, he's not gonna sort of um, confront you in an aggressive way. But he, he's one of the best people I've ever talked to about my life and he's very pastoral, he's very wise. One of the things that you said to me um, that's had most impact, and you've sort of mentioned it a bit here, is this idea about not worrying. There's so much worry, there's, and, and I guess the technical term would be anxiety. Yeah. Um, it's worry that, it, one of the things you said, mate, it's worry that's gonna kill you. Yeah. So you're talking about simplifying your life. Um, have you got anything more to say about that? Because I'll hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it's everything that you buy, you have to work for to pay for it. And then you have to work to maintain it. And we sometimes get these, especially as, as people we get we compare ourselves to other people we get overly ambitious and instead of and that's sometimes when them th hooks get in us they're like hooks and they and they begin to pull us in certain directions it can be at any age it can be in school it can be the way that you look or the way someone else looks or how someone else they approve of you or disapprove of you it can just cause so many so much havoc in your life and uh and also just materialistically, I think, is another huge thing. You know, we've seen it. Look at what happens in America now. It's all around the world. It's just people that are trying to achieve or trying to gain so much and gather so much. But yet there's so, many, there's so much practical advice in the Bible. Don't wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. I think for my wife and I, it's been really a, um, a, an awakening of... Uh, just really simplifying and living simple lives and you and then there's no hooks in you You don't have to do something because you have to do it You do it because you're led to do it and you feel this peace about doing it And the, the things that are in your life that are telling you to do it are pure and true and so uh, You know, I, I think for me, it's just figuring out I, I know that in the beginning God had a plan and that plan uh, was thwarted and something entered into the world uh, that, that we see, you know, rampant today, you know, bitterness and hatred and, and malice and poverty and all these things. But then we see something greater than it coming into the world that's got more power than it. And so I don't want just uh, to be 
to know Jesus and know he has power over death, but also that he came to give us life and give it abundantly. And I know lots of people got different impressions of what they be. Sometimes you see people on TV saying that you should have a certain car if Jesus blesses you. And other people say that you shouldn't have any car if Jesus blesses you. But I think that's the thing where you're working out your own salvation. What does it mean to not just to, to follow Jesus, but what does it mean to be really on fire for him and to really um, to find that abundant life? You know, the joy and the peace that really comes in not having the, uh, the, that stress and, 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 the, and the worries of this world. The, the tribulations will come. They say, the Bible talks about that, you know, that we're going to go through stuff that drives us nuts. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. And so it's working out what that means and looking in. And I, I, we were talking about this yesterday on the bus ride coming in, but it's about that Jesus, I love the fact that he said, one of the things that just kept coming back to me, he said, they got nothing in me. They got nothing in me. And so I, the less that we have in us, the less hooks and the less things that we have in us that are pulling us in directions, uh, I want to be led by the Spirit of God and let Him direct. You know, God is a spirit. You know, He's not this, he's, he's not this mysterious being. He's, he's actually he's a personal God. He's made that known, sending Jesus. But He's also a spirit. And so it's being led by the Spirit of God. And, uh, and that's spirit seems to be in my life it seems to be quiet and a still voice and it's and it's very hard to hear when there's lots of other noise and other things pulling and i know that's something we all know but i think there's so many practical things in the bible that when you look at them and you just read them and you go and do them they actually work it does work it really does work it's it's not just sayings from two thousand year old scriptures or, or five thousand year old scriptures it's it's really it does work and it works in your life if you let it uh, if you submit to it, you know, and submit to it as unto the Lord, it really does work. I'm going to test how well I know you right now. I got a feeling you're a little bit thirsty. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by? That? I just thought you needed a drink. I thought you, I thought you wanted me to open the drink for you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just thought you might like a sip of water. Thanks, mate. Yeah. You, you want to hang some? on to it? Because I can put it down. No, no, I'm fine. I just was trying to hook you up. So before you and Summer, where is she? She's somewhere. Before you and Summer um, got on the bus. Thanks, mate. Got on your own RV and travelled around. Now, you have to understand that that go tour that I was a part of with the Newsboys was 15 months. Insane. Um, Yeah, that was a short one, yeah. (laughs) But... Peter was literally driving an RV, so that meant um, after the show doing a couple of hours, depending on how far it was, because yeah. America's big, big place, about as big as Australia, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and driving himself. So we, we would get in a tour bus at night, one o'clock, midnight, get in our bunks, wake up in the next city. Some other guy's driving us around. We're like, hey, new city, Starbucks, lay around to golf, check my email. Uh-huh. And, but you're actually, he's actually driving himself around. And that's you and Summer, because you kind of felt like, well, you're coming and going, and you hadn't seen each other much. That, is that how that decision got made? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, that and a new adventure. I'm pretty adventurous, as you know. You know, I like to, not for the sake of being adventurous, I think really, and Summer and I both are that. We're, we're, we're pretty, uh, we, you know, I think we, we just wanted to stir the pot. You know, I mean, as get in there and, and try something, uh, uh, it was risky, you know, because obviously our road management and management are like, what are you doing? You're crazy. You know, you're going to drive after the show, you're going to drive 500 miles to the next gig. And uh, yeah. So you're do. pulling up at Walmart. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was the crazy <laughs> thing, which, you, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, the crazy thing is, you know, you, you, you're playing a place like Minnesota, you play to 10,000 people, and then that night you're sleeping at the Target, you know, and, <laughs> and sleeping in the car park of a Target. Or we were, we were camping in. Uh, they have a they have, uh, that campground's called KOAs over there. I, don't, I think they have them in Aussie too, but uh, they KOA campgrounds. And so we just dug it because we were just. I mean, we're not like some of my wife. We, we we weren't camp people. We weren't people that loved to camp. So that was the other part of the adventure. You know what I mean? And uh, you weren't really roughing it in that RV that much. It was pretty nice. We weren't roughing it. No, it was, it was a nice, nice RV. Nice, you know, I've got to admit yeah. that. And uh, but we. But we would go, the band would get driven home back to Nashville and we would, we would just keep going. We'd camp at these campgrounds and, and, and hang out with, with other RV people. And, uh, and it was just a thrill just to be 
you know, because we live in, you know, when we live in Nashville, it's a very, very music city, a lot of CCM crew, and, and it's great, it's a great city. But it was just cool to be, you know, sitting at a campground with another family that didn't have a clue who you were, didn't know nothing about, the, or just, they would just want to talk about is your RV cool and, and how many miles to the next gig, you know what I mean? And so that was, uh, that was part of the thrill too. But yeah, it was, it was a, I, think we, I think we drove 110,000 miles or something in, uh, in uh, about Were there any, any times where you uh, got the gloves on, you're emptying things on an RV that need emptying, and people are like, Anyone recognise you when yeah, you're emptying the poop scooper? Moments. It's pretty yeah. embarrassing because you know you got to empty some stuff out of the thing. Just that, saying. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't want to name it. No, you brought it up. I yeah, I did. Yeah. But it was, uh, yeah. There were some moments, you know, moments at <laughs> you know twelve midnight when the. You know, how did how did getting back with summer and just travelling together? Because I mean, one thing you have to understand that's kind of brutal about this job is, I mean, my wife's in Nashville right now with my two kids, and I get home on Wednesday the day before my my Catherine's birthday. That's right. Yeah. And then, um, you know, so, but Summer's out here with you yeah. and you made a deliberate decision to, we're, we're traveling together. Well, I think, you know, marriage is so important and it's the most important relationship outside of your relationship with God. And it's something that, um, you know, for the two of us, we, we begin to also realize that we've got each other and that's what we've got. That's the most important thing. And so for us, it was investing in that making a decision and getting to know each other better you know that's you know if you you have to be careful in your marriage not not that I want to lecture but it's something that it's so important that if, if you let it's like flying from you fly from Sydney to Honolulu if you're one degree off you ain't gonna make it you're gonna miss it by a thousand miles and so I think for, in your marriage it's just watching the, the, the little things that can creep in the resentments and the and the things and, and guarding that and it's something you always have to guard and so for us it was really making that decision of you know this is more important this is this is more important than the newsboys it's more important than gold records it's more important than anything and so making that decision and be and being on an adventure and being in agreement together about it was really cool and uh, you know and and you know it was really wild for us because you're living in you know things about as big as this stage and so you're living in that for 18 months and so uh, but it was great. We actually, you know, I guess some couples might not grow close together like that, but we did. It was great. So tonight in the show, right? Well, what are we? What's what's going to happen? I mean, is it like are we? I'm going to try and remember the chords. Right. Okay. And then I'm going to try and remember the words. Are we going to hear any like? And then I'm going to try and sing on key. <laughs> right. Okay. Three main objectives. Yeah. Are we going to hear any awesome newsboy songs that you wrote? Uh, I, I'd like to know. You got near. I, I tell you what. I tell you what. I'll do a couple of newsboys ones if you do them with me. <laughs> now the question is, are you going to remember the chords? <laughs> I will tell you that um, I'm really an acoustic guitarist. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. No, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Of so course. At a Starbucks in Nashville, <laughs> That's right. about five years ago, Peter said, let's hang out. I'm like, oh, I just got back. No, I can't, mate. Let's have a coffee. No, I'm, I'm going to... I'll see you in a couple of... No, let's have a coffee. All right. It's not a very demanding guy, so I thought, something's up. So he goes, do you want to join the band? And I literally said, what band? I don't know what he was talking about. <laughs> He's like the Newsboys. And I said, what am I going to play? And he said the guitar, and I'm like, down, 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 yeah. All right, I'll think about it. And so a couple of days later, I said, all right, I'm in. And then kind of sheeping, sheepishly, he called me that five days later. He goes, mate, there's something we really didn't cover. I'm still totally excited. I want you to be in the band. And do you think you can play the guitar parts? <laughs> and, um, and I'd never actually played let much electric guitar. But that song, Breakfast, I had to practice that so hard. I had to walk around. I'd never walked around and played guitar. I mean, you saw what happened last night. The thing doesn't even work when I played it. So it's like, I had to walk around playing the guitar. So, yeah, I think I can That's remember it. it. I'll sing that tonight if you play guitar on it. Should I do it? Is this like a deal or no deal situation? This is totally like we're both catching the wave. that backfired on me? Like?
So this is not a dumper. No, all right. I hope not, because I'm on this one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm in. I'll do it. <laughs> now, there's a song, and I'm going to recount this story as I remember it. There's a song that um, just made it onto the deluxe edition of the Go record, which is really the only Newsboys studio record I was involved in. And it's a song called City to City. And I... Oh, come on. Oh, your dad's here. Great. <laughs> He's got a very high voice. Yeah, um, that's all right. Um, so this song City to City, I heard the demo of it. Peter makes these demos sometimes in aeroplanes where he'll put these... <laughs> these things up and they'll just go -da 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 -da. that's I could sell those things I got heaps of them and um, but he makes up these melodies and then he finds lyrics to go with them well this was one of those songs city to city and I loved it from the get-go I loved it but I really pushed for this song yes, you did. Um, yep. and uh, sat down with Steve Taylor trying to write lyrics that's an intimidating thing to tell Steve Taylor not so much not not a good feeling but eventually <laughs> I wrote a few lyrics on it that's all I did but this song is now on the new Cars 2 soundtrack, That's right? That's right, yeah. Isn't that great? So if you see Cars, you'll hear this man's voice. Yeah. I'm going on a trip from Sete to Sete. It's better than that. It's better than that. It's better than that. Okay, so this new record, we're going to hear two songs from it tonight. We're going to yeah. hear some classic Newsboys. I've got to do some Newsboys because, I, I, yeah, I have to do it. I love, I love doing that stuff, it, you know, I, I wrote it and I grew up, you know, that's, it's part of my culture, so, uh, I, you know, I, I love it. I've got to do them. Got to do a couple. What about, um, <clears throat> He Reigns? Yeah. Nice. Something Beautiful? Right. Huh? Not, Not a shame. Oh, gee, that's going away back, isn't it? Might be able to pull that one out, we'll see. You know? What about um, I Am Free? Can you play that? Yeah, I do that one. Will you dance like David danced? What's that? Will you dance like David danced? I'm going to dance like Peter danced. I'll try to dance like <laughs> David danced. Yeah. Well, I'm really looking forward to the show n even more now because I'm going to spend the afternoon learning guitar parts. <laughs> um, but i tell you something right now. I've been to 17 countries with Peter and uh, listened to him speak in China, in Russia, all over Europe just about every state of America, Australia, New Zealand, South America. Actually, I should say, when we were in Mexico City, we finished this show in this club. We got on the bus and, and we were, were waiting for the rest of the crew and just outside was this guy hocking off illegal Newsboys merchandise that he'd made. Little Mexican guy. And, and, and we were looking at it and everyone's going, oh, look at that guy. And I'm like, actually, it kind of looks pretty good. And within five minutes, we were all buying all his stuff. And he's like, okay. So strange things have happened. But I'll tell you right now, the Bible says a person's testimony about themselves is not really valid, but someone else's is valid. This right here is one of the best people I've ever met in my life. He's a brilliant songwriter. He's a great entertainer. He's a great husband. and He's a good man. And um, I would love it if you guys would give a massive applause to Peter Phil.